This is Qatar, a country in Western Asia on the northeastern coast of the Arabian Peninsula. It shares its sole land border with Saudi Arabia, and the rest of its territory is surrounded by the Persian Gulf. Qatar became fully independent in 1971 after it concluded its special treaty arrangements with the United Kingdom. Originally, their economy focused on fishing and pearl hunting. But after the introduction of the Japanese cultured pearl onto the world market in the 1920s and 30s, Qatar's industry crashed. Luckily, oil was discovered in 1940 in Dukham Field. The discovery transformed the state's economy, leading up to now, with the country having one of the highest standards of living in the world, and with no income tax, for its legal passport holder, that is. The capital is Doha, home to over 90% of the nation's 2.8 million residents. Of those 2.8 million, about 85% are expatriate workers. The high number of foreign workers means that the country also has an unnatural male-to-female ratio of three men for every single woman. The main reason for this is probably that it's harder for women to gain working visas and employment in Qatar, as it is a very traditional Islamist country. It is a high-income economy backed by the world's third largest natural gas and oil reserves. In 2018, the World Bank named it the highest emitter of CO2 in the world. But gas exports are not the only reason for this title. This one kilometer long walkway is entirely air-conditioned, spitting out cool air at the feet of its users. It's an outdoor park. And the Qatar Plaza has recently been unveiled as the first open-air, air-conditioned commercial space. So they're trying to cool their house by leaving the fridge door open. And one of the amazing perks of being a Qatari citizen is that you don't have to pay for electricity or water. It's subsidized and provided free. Migrants, same as is the case with taxes, have to pay. In United Arab Emirates, an incredible 70% of total electricity expenditure goes on air conditioning. So for Qatar, this number is probably closer to 80%. Locals are happy to leave air conditioning running while they go away on week-long trips just in order to be able to return to cool and comfortable homes. And many of these homes are not very energy efficient, as government building regulations are quite relaxed. Doha's West Bay is filled up with glass skyscrapers, which while facing the sun all day are impossible to keep cool unless heavily air conditioned. Geographically, Doha is uniquely positioned to receive hot dry air from the desert to the west and hot moist air from the gulf, meaning that it's not just extremely hot, but also humid. Additionally, there are no lakes or rivers in the country. As such, it has to expend enormous energy for water desalination, and some years it receives less than 2 centimeters of rainfall. Qatar is heating up faster than almost anywhere else on the planet. Along with other major Arabian cities such as Abu Dhabi and Dubai, Doha is the frontrunner for surpassing livable temperature thresholds by as early as 2070. And these problems are particularly stacked when it comes to sports. A marathon held in 2019 for the World Athletics Championship was not a success. About 40% of the contestants didn't make it to the finishing line, even though the event was held at night. After just 40 minutes, athletes began collapsing from heat exhaustion. Scientists have calculated that even with shade and unlimited drinking water, a healthy adult will die if wet bulb temperatures, which take into account factors such as humidity, wind speed and cloud cover, exceed 35 Celsius for six hours. And Qatar is soon going to be all over your headlines as the host nation of the 2022 World Cup. In order to prepare for the event, it installed air conditioning in all eight of its new football stadiums. Qatar 2022 will be the first World Cup held in the Middle East as part of FIFA's pledge to stage at least one major international tournament in the region before 2030. But considering June and July are the hottest months in the country, it was deemed as infeasible to have the cup during the traditional season, and hence it was moved to November and December. A recent local law protects people by prohibiting working outdoors between 10 a.m. and 3.30 p.m. There are no reliable figures on the death of migrant workers in Gulf countries, which do not release statistics and have regularly contested estimates released by NGOs and the media. It is likely that the extent of life lost due to heat is highly underreported, attributed to natural causes. 
such as cardiac arrest. Uninhabitable temperatures won't be the only problem facing Qatar, however. As an exposed peninsula, it is very vulnerable to sea level rise. The Arabian Gulf is also a very dusty place, and combined with industrial fumes, construction, soil erosion, and traffic, it creates some of the worst air pollution in the world, with Doha ranking pretty close to the top, worse than most industrial Chinese cities. Yet similar to the other petrol states, it has been slow to embrace any kind of positive climate action. Indeed, while sitting on the world's biggest reserves of gas, Doha has little incentive to change anything, especially to promote renewable energy. It tries to make the problem go away through big flashy projects and by agreeing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But considering the context of a possibly perilous future, with sea level rise, uninhabitable temperatures, and poisonous air, its commitment is rather questionable. Especially when you consider that the country is willing to host a global sports event, the likes of which it has never hosted before, requiring the building of unique stadiums to keep the athletes alive. Certainly, climate change is not yet taken very seriously here, and many citizens may still consider it to be Western propaganda. Money isn't really enough to solve this problem. Public opinion needs to change. Climate change is a relatively new topic. One of the most promising new methods of getting through to people is by incorporating environmental education along with religious practice. It is, however, particularly hard to reconcile the economic incentives with ecological ones, especially when it comes to the petrol states. And it is easy for Western countries to point fingers, since they have already grown to the point that they can think about slowing down their rates of industrial expansion. And more recently, with Europe looking for a way to replace Russian gas, Qatar is becoming the leading alternative, meaning there's an incentive for further expansion of the industry, which is already happening. Either way, given the abundance of sunshine and potential for renewable energy, it can seem somewhat puzzling that most Gulf countries aren't embracing solar or wind power. Oil and gas is still the only game in town where a state can extract extraordinary levels of profit. The cost bases for renewable energy are still much higher. And if you're in charge of an autocratic state and your power relies on buying public support with things like no taxes and free electricity, then you just can't afford to turn off the pumps. Climate change, however, does not care about the economy. To me, this is one of the most interesting paradoxes of the modern world. And watching how this plays out hopefully won't be too terrifying. And whenever I blame myself for forgetting to turn the lights off or take another super cheap Ryanair flight, I remind myself that Qatar has outdoor air conditioning. This is my Patreon map. Become a member and be added to this map. Now have a guess where this footage is taken and I'll see you soon.